Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to New Books in African American Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Omari Averett Phillips, the host of the channel. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Holly A. Pinero Jr. about his new book, The Family's, the Family's Civil War, Black Soldiers and the Fight for Racial Justice. Dr. Holly Pinero Jr., welcome to the show. Thank you so much, and hello to the audience out there listening. Awesome. Well, Dr. Pinero, I, I wonder if you could begin just by telling us a bit about yourself. Ah, yes. Uh, so let's see. Ah, the short version. So I was uh, raised in a military household, which directly influences my work, as I learned over the years. Uh, My mother served for 20 plus years in the United States Navy. Uh, When I was about six months old, the entire family was deployed to uh, Melbourne, Australia. So I actually had an Australian accent until I was a teenager. So it would be Melbourne. Uh, Let's see. Because of grad school and military life, this is the 30th place that I've lived. So I am very familiar with the constant shifting of locations and interacting with new peoples and communities. Um, Let's see. I would also say that just some things about myself. I have always been passionate about history and particularly the history of Black people. And that's because of the commitment that that my family had, Uh, particularly two of my uncles who I believe I was like eight or 10. They bought me the autobiography of Malcolm X and Frederick Douglass and said, you are going to learn about your people. And at the time, I thought it was a little odd, but now looking back on it, like it was amazing because a lot of the stuff I read in there would be used in conversations when I was a student, right? And what textbooks didn't emphasize about these and other people's lives. So I was always grateful. And I've loved history because I get to ask questions, even if I don't necessarily get to the answer. Um, went to community college. I would just want to give a shout out to Valencia College and really any community college because they are absolutely amazing and um, very grateful for the experiences I had there. Uh, went to the University of Central Florida and the University of Iowa and have just been traveling until I have reached Furman University and excited to be here and talking about these families and uh, hopefully getting people to want to read them. So I wonder if you could tell us uh, how you came to this project. Uh, yes. So <laughs> let's see. Part of it is my obsession lifelong with the film Glory. All right. So for those who haven't seen it, it came out in, I think, like 1990. Uh, Academy Award winning, particularly Denzel for a supporting actor. Had Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, Carrie Elways, uh, Andre Brower, I believe if I'm saying his name right, and Matthew Broderick, just to name a few. That was one of those films that in social studies classes they played every year, right? So it was like, you always got it. And I loved it. I still love it. Uh, But then also, I would say for me, I was always interested in the Civil War as this defining moment in in American history, arguably as many other scholars have shown in global history. And particularly, what is life like for Black soldiers? And that is, again, because I was raised in a military family. And that understanding how families and communities of those who serve or have served uh, is very important, right? It transcends even the people I've been researching on, military communities and those who support them are very important. Uh, The other part, to be honest, was there, part of it is for the Civil War is I had family members who were formerly enslaved in South Carolina and Florida. So I wanted to, to look at what was life like for those who were freed, but also what does it mean for those who were freeborn? And I say that because I have relatives who are in Philadelphia and New York City. So I basically understanding what is black life like during this this period of time of the Civil War era, really the 19th and early 20th. Uh, And then over time, I would say my passion has been to advocate for communities. Um, So for me, I'm very grateful to have a job that I love, to have a job that allows me to empower students and to empower the people I study even if I'm not necessarily talking about, let's say, uh, to an audience of people who are of color, but still how history matters and that people matter in ways that are hopefully meaningful. So I love teaching. I love research. and I mean, I love my job. I absolutely love it. And for me, it's really the excitement that people have in the classroom, you know, but also the excitement that people have to, to, to listen to these people's stories. Because the one thing that I've always struggled with, as I told you previously to the recording, 
I genuinely felt, and many other people have felt this way, that like, I'm assuming, uh, we do this work and you hope people care, right? Especially as a grad student, you're struggling through comps, you're working on your prospectus, you're you know, defending it. And the whole time I would call my mom and just be very depressed because I would say, I, I care about these people. And I'm not saying that because like they're interested. These are people like me. These are people who come from the communities I do. These are people whose, whose lives are very important. And I pray that others will care and will want to learn about them in the hopes that it inspires them. But then also, particularly to me, this is a love letter to Black Philadelphia, because I want them to know that even though it's about 185 soldiers and their relatives, which comes out to a thousand people, this is a way to understand Philly in a meaningful way and how their persistence against gender and racial discrimination is inspiring. Because as I tell my students, when we talk about various historical moments, I would give up because for me at a certain point, the systems just would seem so un, unending, right? And to me, yet the people that I have the privilege to research and talk about, they inspire me when I'm having a hard day. They inspire my students when, when they're questioning, you know, what we see today. And I'm saying they never gave up. Why are you, right? Why am I? And, and, and it's like, those are some powerful conversations that sometimes I have to have with myself about, you know, I'm doing this work and others do this kind of work to, to recenter families, to recenter communities who are critical to understanding history. It's not a small segment of people. It's a larger group. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the methodology and the parameters that you used uh, in constructing this study. Yeah, so the, the book, as far as the parameters, uh, is an extension of my dissertation, uh, which was looking for the dissertation at 50, 25 from uh, New York City and 25 from Philadelphia, from 1850 to 1880, to look at what was life like for Black men or boys who became Civil War era soldiers, but who were they before they served? Right. So what was their life like? Did they go to school? Were they married? Were they the first freeborn in their household? What happened to them and their family experiences during and after the war? For this book, uh, The Family Civil War, I focused primarily on Philadelphia. That's not to say I don't care about New York City. I've written extensively about Black New York, and I will always continue to advocate for their stories to be told. Shout out to William Surreal's book about Black New York soldiers in the Civil War era. Uh, but the book is looking from 1850 into the 1930s. And I really wanted to understand the, the, the lived experiences of their entire family. Who were Black soldiers as children? Did they go to school? Did they go to Institute for Color Youth? Did they go to a public school? Did they not? What was their employment uh, situations like? Were some of these young children forced to, because of racial discrimination, to find work? What was their households like? What roles did the Black women in the last place? Spoiler alert, a lot. In fact, they are, I would argue, the most critical individuals to their family structure and society in, in so many ways. And I'm happy to go in more detail on that. Uh, but it was really about examining these Black families' lives over an extended period of time to ultimately argue that I believe we need to stop talking about the Civil War or Reconstruction as a defining moment in Black people's lives. And I'm going to give a shout out to Dr. Amy Morell Taylor at the University of Kentucky, where I heard this, and I'm a big fan of her work. I will always advocate for people to read her scholarship. Uh, as she says, and I agree with her, that it's the people that define the historical moments, not the historical moments defining the people, and that their lives go before the Civil War and after. Even if they're no longer alive, the memory of them still persists, as we can see today in so many different ways. And we need to talk about these people as people, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, families. And if we do that, we do justice to their lives and we can be more inclusive in understanding the prominent role that Black families play in keeping the, the communities together, keeping their families together, and also ultimately supporting the Civil War as, as far as the United States victory and then fighting for the memory of these people. Uh, in terms of the sources, because a lot of people ask this, uh, I would say, just a quick list, it's the Civil War pension records, uh, which I'm happy to talk about, but just a quick uh, rundown. There were multiple, there was the invalid or a veteran's pension. There were multiple dependents, which ranged from daughter, uh, 
uh, or children to widows and mothers and sometimes fathers, which I've only seen at least one case of that. Um, looking at black newspapers, particularly the weekly Anglo-African that published out of New York City and the Christian Recorder, which I still believe is in publication and connected to the AME Church, but also white newspapers like the New York Times, uh, published memoirs of black soldiers, not just of the third, the sixth and the eighth that I look at for the United States Colored Infantry or USCI, but even those who are connected to the 54th and 55th Massachusetts that are basically the groups for the film Glory. And prominent speeches by people like Frederick Douglass and others uh, to, to understand how rhetoric doesn't always match reality for these people's lives, which is was difficult for me to write because I went against a lot of what I used to think and was taught about the Civil War era and Black Soul. Uh, and then I'll just also um, throw in the federal census and city directories. They're phenomenal records. They are super dry, right? Like it's literally just a list of information. However, that's one of the best ways I was able to trace these people's lives to find out marriages, to find out education, disabilities, who lived in the homes, what was their family structure, right? Which actually a number of instances were interracial and were also including individuals who were part of the uh, refugee from the Underground Railroad. And these families were very, they had to adapt. So they don't just limit themselves to uh, those through marriage or those through uh, different dynamics. Other, like I would also argue they're using fictive kinship. As I tell my students, you know, for example, some of these people take in uh, individuals to protect them from various forms of discrimination. And once you bring someone into your home, your residence, there is a level of trust that you have with those people that you're going to bring them into your most personal and private space. And when you're in that space as that individual, that family member, you want that household to stay afloat. There is, when I was a grad student, there were many times I was crashing on people's couches doing research, and I was very committed to doing my part to keep that home together. But I also recognized that there was a level of trust and care that those people had for me. And so I don't want to use the terms border because I feel like that limits their dynamics in a way to a quid pro quo rather than there might just be a level of empathy, of love, or, or what have you that we need to acknowledge and not limit their relationships and doing so makes it more inclusive. So using that and then compiled military service records were the, the, the resources or sources that I used to uncover these people's lives. And I'm very grateful that I was able, hopefully you all will agree, to tell a, a more nuanced understanding of the freeborn family experience. Yeah, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more and explain the concept uh, of fictive kin a little bit more. It was really sort of central, I think, to these families. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that and sort of the role that it plays in the study as well. Yeah, fictive kin is very, very important. So that is, as I had to learn doing the research over time, uh, it's, a, it's a term that many scholars have used. Uh, not, it's very interdisciplinary. I've seen scholars who do Japanese history use it. Obviously, scholars who do the enslaved experiences, so whether we're talking about Genovese, whether we're talking about Kansas, so many others, and in that, in the dynamics of slavery, particularly Black families, because of racial discrimination and the system itself, were constantly trying to destroy Black families, and that these families had to adapt and take on relatives that weren't necessarily through a marriage or through uh, blood because they cared about each other, because they loved these people. And for me, it was like when I started to really think about some of these families and seeing how, for instance, a number of the soldiers in, as veterans are living in residences with other individuals, or when they're young children, they're living in households with formerly enslaved women who are in their 80s and 90s. And I had to ask myself, what's going on there, one? And, and why, would they do, why would their families do that? And for me, I started to really I wanted to embrace the, the care that these people showed. I wanted to embrace the, the commitment that they had to protect each other. And that bringing in sometimes children who are very young or individuals who are very old, they're doing it to help them. And, and if we recognize the humanity of their relationships, 
we can stop limiting them to the term order. And again, I want to acknowledge, you read some of my previous work, I use that term a lot. So I'm even critiquing my own previous scholarship when I make that. Fictive kin, I believe, is a, a, a way to, and Native American indigenous scholars have also used it as well, um, to acknowledge their households and families as they saw them. Because that to me was one of the most important things. I wanted to respect these families the way they and their communities recognize them, not how the federal and state governments do, which is hence where the title comes from and these families are at war. And so just to talk about sort of the community, so your study uses Philadelphia as its setting. Um, why did you choose Philadelphia and what sort of free black community did these soldiers actually come from? Uh, why Philly? Uh, the, the truth? One, I have family in Philly. So as a broke grad student and, you know, a junior scholar at the time, doing the research where I had family members uh, was a lot financially easier. But also I was... I, there was something about Philly that just always interested me. There's been a lot. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania has a, has a rich, rich history, right? There's no question. Many scholars have written about Philadelphia history, particularly in the Civil War era. But for me, it was just like, I was always interested in one. There's these, one of the, the strongest abolitionist networks. You have the who's who, right? In terms of national recognition, you've got Lucretia Mott, who, I'm I'll happy to talk about later and how important her role is to Black military service. You have Octavius Cotto. You have the Purvises. You have the Fortins, particularly the women in those households are very important. You have Emily Davis. You have Frederick Douglass coming in. I mean, you name it, right? There's so much happening there on top of large-scale and small-scale racial violence that was unfortunately very common throughout the 19th. Uh, so as I often joke, Philadelphia is known as the city, the city of brotherly love that hated brothers and sisters. Right. And uh, because you saw it in terms of the racial violence that was still normalized, in Philly, which is directly in contestation to the abolitionist network that was very strong. So you'll have, I believe, the 1834, 1838, 1842 and then 1876 race riots. And they're horrifically bad. The 1838 burning of Pennsylvania Hall. It just blows my mind that that violence, racial violence broke out because black and white women, abolitionists, walked arm in arm down the streets of Philadelphia. And that sight was enough for the large scale race riot that would ensue, that would end with the burning of black businesses, schools, churches, and residences. And a number of black residents will be arrested by the local police who will say it's all their fault, which wasn't uncommon in other locations. So for me, it was like, all of that is happening. On top of Philadelphia is one of the hubs for recruiting for United States Colored Trooper USCT regiments. So it's like there was all of that context. And I just wanted to enter, enter in with understanding all that and the post-war issues. Let's talk about Black families, specifically those who will serve or want to, but can't. I mean, the messiness of military service um, is very complicated. But what is life like? Because one of the things I wanted to highlight, and hopefully that came across, is I am very tired of people talking about the Civil War uh, as the, the first time that these Black people fought, right? They put on the eagle on the button and they did. The, no, unfortunately, due to racial discrimination that they are born into, they are engaged in a race war for their entire lives and even before and sadly long after, and I would say is still persistent to this day. And if we understand that, we under, then we can talk about how military service provides a new pathway. But also, if we look before, during, and after the war, how Black women, particularly in places like Philadelphia, are essential to understanding uh, the civil rights movement at that time and the support for the war effort. Black families, and especially Black women, are very important to understanding the Civil War era and Black military service and not acknowledging them. And this is coming from the, the words of some of the Black soldiers who wrote about it and even William D. Kelly, who will say during a, a speech in 1863, in his words, that the most important individuals to supporting the war effort are Black women, particularly in their ability to influence and listen. So if people at the time knew that, why don't we? So for me, this was also a way to put more respect on what people then and people who live in these communities now still know. 
we have to talk about black families and black Absolutely. And so in talking about some of those black families, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the uh, complicated decision the African-American men and their families wrestled with surrounding and enlisting in the Union Army. Yeah, that, that's a part that I, I, I'm glad to see scholarship is, is really turning towards, is uh, critiquing the rah-rah, everyone flock to enlistment uh, claim of black military service, because that's not true at all. And in the case of Philadelphia that I've seen looking at the third, the sixth, and the eighth USDI, not many do uh, that are Philadelphian born. Um, they, for a number of reasons, uh, black men don't want to. One of those includes when Frederick Douglass will go into a black church in Philly and assume when he says to the crowd, all right, who's going to enlist, right? And he does the Frederick Douglass very passionate speech, right? Like, you're going to listen. Nobody stands up. And then a white uh, individual in the crowd, white man, says, why should they? What has this country given them? It has uh, legitimized and legalized the oppression of any black person within its borders. It has protected slavery. This country is not promising them anything other than hardship. And so those kind of emotions, on top of the heartache, I really wanted to highlight that too. The decision to enlist, as other scholars know, it was a family decision in many cases. And a number of the enlistees who would make that decision, it forever destroys their family in terms of being a unit that, that they were prior to. Husbands and sons and brothers and family members will never return. Or if they do return, they are not uh, in the same able-bodied condition that they were when they enlisted. Some of the soldiers uh, will go stay willingly, and anyone who enlists by 1863, unfortunately, most likely not going to survive the war. They are giving their last goodbyes on their enlistment documents. They're writing on the edges of those records. This is the only proof that you and I are legitimate. Right? So it's like that, that heartache, it's, it's real. Um, and particularly when we add in the complications of racism in terms of pay and, and that, uh, how that trickles down to the families in ways that more people need to acknowledge. We talk a lot about soldiers who refuse pay. Uh, particularly for the Massachusetts Black regiments. But for me, it's like, and I understand they're doing so because it's a, uh, they are rightfully uh, critiquing the, the denigration of their man as Black men by the federal government's policies and the War Department. But also it's a, it raises tensions with their families who are going to be questioning, where's that money? You may not see yourself as, a, you may see yourself as a man in this lens, but you have responsibilities to your family back home, which if we understand that, then we can grapple with what these black men and families are really going through. Every military policy, whether the military and the government wanted to acknowledge it, always hit back home. Every military policy, right? And so it's like, these are the, the kinds of things I wanted to illuminate, is that someone can talk about putting on that uniform as Douglas will say. But when I'm reading a pension record where a relative in the 1880s is saying, what have you given? Have you taken everything from us? I've never seen my father again. I never saw my husband again. Right? And like that pain that lasts, I want to tell that their truth as well and that they're hurt. And the, the, you know, the Civil War ends and you know, slavery ends, which is very important, but the pain and racism that these people feel lasts for generations. And so while the men are at war, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role the African-American women played in their families during that time period. Yeah, I mean, this is, Black women are, are everything to the war effort. Uh, and, and I'm you know, leaning on other scholars who have also highlighted this. Uh, black women will make themselves very visible at Camp William Penn, uh, specifically where the soldiers train. But uh, as, as other scholars uh, note, and even black soldiers at the time, they're literally at every camp they can be at to support black soldiers. For example, in the state of New York, it's black women who are going to make it their personal mission to provide clean water and medical treatment for the soldiers as they train because the United States War Department isn't doing its job. Uh, black women are going to be in the state of Iowa supporting the 60th USCI as they train. Uh, black soldiers uh, for the Massachusetts Regiment will say that Firstly, black women are the most important recruiters, but also they are always here, right? And what I saw at Camp William Penn is mothers who will take up work as a laundress right near the camp because they wanted to see their relative. Women who will come to the camp 
on a regular basis, which is important to recognize how as they do that and they put themselves in many ways, unfortunately, in the firing line, once they sit on various forms of public transportation, which legally was allowed to racially discriminate against any individual uh, who is a person of color, black women are defiantly understanding that and put themselves into those situations to demand to be seen as women as they in their community see them, but also to show that they are patriotic. And one of my uh, families that I just, it just they stuck with me so much is Benjamin Davis, and particularly his widow, Mary Leighton. Uh, she will bring their newborn son to Camp William Penn and force him, as he's training, to acknowledge their son, Jerome, as legitimate. That, that kind of story hit me so hard because I was not expecting that. And to see her be so committed to making sure that he acknowledged it, but that it's documented in federal records was so powerful. To me. And to me, it was just like, when we talk about, and, and also I'd just like to add, and this is part of a new project I'm working on, a number of black civilians get married at Camp William Penn, which I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Because as uh, Tara Hunter and others have noted, Black women or black people do this in freed spaces, right? Marrying under the flag is the term they use. But they're doing it in free states as well. So for me, it's like black communities are at the training spaces. Black women are doing everything to support the war effort and their community. And once, and that's not even acknowledging how all this stuff they're doing on the home front, right? In terms of what they're doing in their homes, in their churches, in their, you name it. So it's like, to me, there, there has been a lot written about white women's role, North and South, in the Civil War era. There is not, there should be even more attention to the prominent roles that Black women play in so many different ways. And they have been doing this work before the war. It's the, so to me, it's not, and others, it's not new. It's just they're evolving and they're demonstrating yet again their important role to society. I wonder if you could be if you could expand a little bit more on uh, what uh, some of the hardships that these families sort of faced um, after the men sort of enlisted in the Civil War as well. So some of the hardships would obviously include the immediate separation of family members. Uh, another one is going to be the federal enlistment bounties that a, a number of these 185 soldiers do not receive upon their enlistment. Uh, which was supposed to come at the end of their service. So, you know, all of a sudden you go from making hundreds of dollars to now you're without that bounty, which directly impacts your family. Some were able to get local bounties. Um, and it was interesting because a number of the local bounties were created to help support the families. So again, people at the time understood that the family is critical to the war effort in terms of economic restitution. The other... Hardship one is going to be all black soldiers are going to be paid less than white soldiers, not because of any lack of, of you know, putting quotes around this worth or commitment or whatever. Uh, it's because of their skin color. And so they're going to be paid uh, $10 less, but after a military clothing deduction, it's actually $7. And that impacts directly their families and the men. And they write about this. And the other one is a number of these soldiers Black soldiers in general won't be paid for months. I've seen some records of seven to nine months. And I use this example with my students all the time. I said, if we look at these soldiers from an employer and an employee relationship. So for me, again, I'm thinking of W.E.B. Du Bois, Philadelphia Negro, and other scholars who do labor history. Um, I tried to apply that lens and just say, all right, these people have signed a contract with the federal government which says they're going to be paid on a monthly wage and X, Y, and Z. And for nearly a year, they're not paid. As I say to my students, if Furman don't pay me on the first of the month, one of y'all are teaching this class because I'm out, right? And, and, and so then we talk about, would you come to work? And they're like, of course I wouldn't. I'm like, why not? And so as we're having that conversation, I'm like, uh-huh, okay, now let's go back to this in military service. If we leave, we're seen as cowards and failures by the larger society. So who matters more, being seen as a coward and a traitor by your country or being a failure to your family because they are pleading and begging for you to come home? And once we have those conversations, and I tackle this a lot in the book, we can have a more nuanced understanding of Black manhood and womanhood 
in a way that under that recognizes that they are hit, getting hit from both sides. And it's not their fault. I want to be clear. This is discriminatory policies and attitudes. It is not their fault, but it impacts them in a holistic standard. And so after the war, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of the pension process and what that was like for these uh, for these families of uh, USCT soldiers. Yeah. All right. So the pensions. Oh boy. All right. So the thing with the pensions, uh, I still can remember pitching the idea for my dissertation. Right. I pitched that I was going to look at how black soldiers reflected on 13, 14, 15. Them in civil rights, right? Like the big moments, Reconstruction, right? Like they never talked about that, at least the soldiers I looked at. Um, though one soldier in passing talks about he was at what he calls, quote, the surrender, end quote. What he was talking about, he was at Appomattox. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, note this to the audience. Black soldiers were critical to the end of the Civil War, and particularly chasing Robert E. Lee's forces to Appomattox, and they were physically at the surrender. And to me, when I see that that famous like image, right, like that is dismissing that black men are part of that story and black people are part of that story. The pensions are super messy. Uh, just a quick history of it. They date back to the Revolutionary War. And if I'm, hopefully I don't get the number wrong, but I think it was at least 18 black men at the time of the post-Revolutionary War did receive a pension. So there's a long history of what will become a federally funded social welfare program. And I just want to give a shout out to Dr. Brandy Brimmer's excellent book, Claiming Union Widowhood, where she tackles this in much more uh, uh, detail. And it's a great book. Please check it out. And also James G. Mendez, uh, great sacrifice. For me, the pensions were highlighting issues of disabilities, physical, psychological, and emotional. Uh, I was talking about issues of unemployment. It was talking about struggles to keep families together, uh, domestic violence, which is something I never, ever anticipated seeing in there. Uh, the, the persistence of Black families to have their lives remembered. So it took on this life of its own, and I had to adapt what I wanted to talk about. For those who aren't familiar, the Civil War, the pension, particularly Civil War pensions, uh, by the late 19th century will take up the majority of the federal budget. And presidential elections and campaigns, one of the key tenets is the pensions. So there is this hyper vigilance, obsession, if you will, by the federal government and the Bureau of Pensions, which becomes the VA, uh, to monitor those who are want and become a pensioner and to limit the access to those roles, even after the 1890 expansion of the policy. Uh, the pensions are complicated. Uh, you never know what you're going to find. One record might have one page. And then I have one that was 800 pages. So that was fun to document and to try to disseminate. But that's where I started to find out the stories about what was Black life like? What was Black life like before the war? Because a number of these veterans and their families talk about life as young children. They talk about, so Charles Penn is one of the soldiers who talks about his parents died when he was very young, and he had to live at the colored rep call it this orphan asylum uh, for black children, he will be apprenticed out, which was very common for black orphanages because they were more interested in finding employment rather than scholastic endeavors. And that was something that he wanted people to know in his record that I went to that space uh, and it wasn't as great as what the administrators had talked about. Uh, the pension battles, and that's really another layer to the story in terms of the, the title, is these families are at war uh, with the federal government, but also even with some individuals within their communities, including uh, African-Americans, to have their families seen the way they see them, right? So when they're the questions of legitimacy really come into play, particularly for families who don't get a legal marriage. And many Black families are going to be punished in terms of the federal government's assessment of their families because of the questions of legality. And that was something I really wanted to tackle because there's a lot of great work that talks about the freed experience. Shout out to the late Megan McClintock, Norley Frankel, you know, Chandra Manning, I mean, Taylor, who have done, and you know, Thavalia Glint, amazing scholar, um, who have done that work and must continue to do that work. Never want to say we shouldn't talk about the freed families and uh, Donald Schaefer as well. But when we talk 
what is life like for freeborn black families trying to navigate the pensions? Uh, and there's been people like Kelly Mezarek who have done this in Ohio and, and others that I wanted to be in that conversation. Because one of the things I found is that freeborn black families who live in states where slavery was abolished, they're going to be punished because the federal government will essentially say, you had the opportunity to get a legal marriage and you refused to do so. So therefore, you don't have access to the pension. So there's actually a privileging of freed families and punishment of freeborn families. And that will lead to so much invasions of privacy into people's lives. The, the information that I learned about the familial dynamics of these people is shocking. I didn't need to know. And the one thing I always tried to, to do when I was working on this was to imagine what was it like to have to sit in front of a committee or a pension agent who was a white man who was demanding for you or me or any individual to prove yourself as legitimate and worthy of this uh, pension. And it, it was shocking because a number of these uh, women had to divulge the first time they were intimate with uh, whether their child was legitimate, when was a child born, like all of these things that I didn't anticipate. But I wanted to make sure that I talked about these families and the pension battle from a empowering standpoint. It's real easy uh, for some people to look at their hardships, and there are many, as as one in which they were victims. And I do not, of course, they were they experienced discrimination that was due to so many different factors. But it's their persistence. It's that they fought even when a, a pension was rejected to continue to apply, sometimes for decades, to continue to provide testimony, to make sure even when they're asked offensive questions, that they say it in a manner that says, oh, you want to learn about this? I'm going to tell you. And this is all there is to say about this. And we're not going to talk about it ever again. And so for me, it was like these families are committed to forcing the federal government to see them as legitimate and to see that families, black families experience the war and they are the torch bearers of the history. There's a lot of conversations today about, you know, the politics of statues and I'm not getting into that. For me, it's like, oh, if you want a statue, if you want my honest opinion, let's do statues about the black community, black families. Yes, we should have black men in uniform as statues, but I want ones that show the people around them, those support networks, their part of the story too. And as Dr. Hillary Green notes, they're the living monuments. And I'll just say this for all the problems of pension, and there are many. One thing I want to acknowledge that even with all the forms of invasion to these people's lives, this is how we're able to have these conversations that you and I are having. And it's that Black families are the ones who are fighting to keep the stories going. And it is my privilege to continue to do it on their behalf. And so you say this a little bit earlier in our conversation, and I just want you to speak a little bit more about it. So in the book, you talk about how the Civil War is just one of the it's just one fight in a larger war for racial equality that African American soldiers and their families were involved in. And so I just would love for you to say just a little bit more about yeah. that. So part of it uh, is coming from the fact that I tried to, and hopefully I did a good job on this, is like highlighting what was Black Philadelphia like, particularly 1854. And to denote that Black people, even Black children, including uh, Jacob C. White Jr., who will be one of the individuals that is also a recruiter for Black soldiers in a few years, they're taught Black children will have conversations with administrators and even the Pennsylvania governor in which they're saying, we are citizens. We deserve equality. You may put us in an inferior school uh, in terms of due to racial discrimination where Black schools, public schools were... Uh, underfunded, crowded, and all these things, but they were still extremely intelligent. And, and so that was just one layer, but also how Black women uh, and Black family members are fighting against racial discrimination in terms of oc occupational opportunities, and that every member of a household had to contribute, whether it was seasonal, temporary, or full-time work, to make that family survive. And part of that, to me, to be honest, is just living in those situations myself and understanding that Black families are committed to, to fighting and supporting each other. This isn't new, right? And they were doing it then. They were doing it before the study. They're doing it now. And so for me, I just wanted to tell their story in a way that 
I would say I've experienced life and that we are committed to fighting against various forms of racial and gender discrimination. And if we acknowledge that as young children or as young men, that these future soldiers and men veterans who survived the war, they are living in a world in which they understand, unfortunately, because of their skin color, they are seen as inferior in the larger society and they are constantly being denigrated, but they will fight and they will do it collectively. And they do it in a multitude of ways that is empowering and that the civil war is just part of their war. And the civil war opens up in some ways, Pandora's box in terms of uh, obsessions of the federal government into black family structures, which is a whole other conversation. And there could be much more uh, scholarship on that. I just wanted to be more understanding and paint a picture of who these men were or young boys were before the war. Where did they come from? Who were the people during the war that they're writing letters on to? Who were the people after the war that are advocating for their memory to be remembered? Or in the later post or the early 19th, or sorry, 20th century, that it's their children who are the nurses informally, who are the support networks, who are writing the pension bureau regular on behalf of their relatives. These families are committed to have full equality in and outside of military service. And so I just wonder, what, what do you want readers to take away from your book? Oh, <laughs> I hope that, um, and you're free to correct me <laughs> if uh, hopefully this does it, is that I've written it in a way that is accessible to a wider audience, in a way that um, hopefully many people will find interesting, and that military families, I've had the privilege of talking in spaces to military families, again, which I am one, a child of, and that people who are not just black, but people of color who are white, who are served in and outside of the United States are like, you get it. You understand the real struggles that we collectively experience and the bureaucracy that you talk about and the hardships with the pensions. We still deal with this today. I had a gentleman who was doing some work um, recently at my house and we talked and I was talking to him about my book and he was like, man, he's like, let me tell you about my struggles with the pensions. And, and so for me, it was like that people can understand that we need to do more in terms of pension benefits. Uh, and we need to do more to understand family experiences, to understand the military. And you know, I'll just say my hope is that, you know, to shout out to anyone that's listening to this, uh, that this is a book that makes its way into the Pennsylvanian and particularly Philadelphian school systems community colleges. I want this read into local libraries. If you can't afford uh, to purchase it, you know, ask your local library to do so because I want people's stories to be told and I want people to understand that this is just part of a larger conversation. That if we're going to talk about military service and we don't understand the people surrounding them, the environments that they come from, we're not doing justice to their stories. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Panero, we've taken up a lot of your time, so I'll just ask one final question. What are you working on now? Oh, uh, let's see, painting the interior of my house. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, so other than uh, getting ready to celebrate the birth of our first child in a few months, um, I have started preliminary work on the second book, which will look at all Black Pennsylvanians who serve uh, and in the 11 USCT regiments from Pennsylvania, but particularly their experiences at Camp William Penn. So I'm going to do a much broader study of Black Pennsylvania, and some of my preliminary work has already found there are a lot of Black soldiers who are coming from the rural parts of the state, and, and that's important because that's going to, I think, open up and be more inclusive of how so many more communities are part of the story. And my hope of all hopes is that this becomes something that, you know, empowers uh, communities to understand that their histories matter. I recognize there's usually a privileging of places like Philadelphia, uh, of Harrisburg, because finding those records is admittedly easy. But, you know, as Dr. Hillary Green's soon to be coming book, which I'll give a shout out, is going to revolutionize the field, I promise you. She and, and hearing the stories of her family who live in Pennsylvania, that it sticks with me that they want to be remembered and they want scholars to, to talk about them and not just the urban black experience. And they're right and they matter. And I want to do as, as others are doing. I want to do that as well. I want to 
I want to understand that we, there are so many different uh, experiences that Black people uh, have, and understanding the diversity of that will reflect more reality. Well, I think I, I can speak for myself. I'm sure I'm speaking for others. Really looking forward to your second book after this one. Dr. Holly A. Pinero, uh, Family Civil War. I want to thank you again for being on the show today. I really enjoyed it and take care. Thank you so much. Have a great day.